All right, here we go. Brand new Flyers Daily for the 22nd of February, 2024. Flyers Daily, as always, presented by Ticketmaster. Make more memories live. Flyers end the skid. They get a win over the Chicago Blackhawks. Our first look at Connor Bedard as a member of the opposition. You get to see him in Philadelphia coming up on yours truly's birthday on March 30th. Uh, but the Flyers, they'd won those four straight games. They went into Toronto. They got natural hat tricked by Austin Matthews, ended up losing in overtime uh, four to three. Uh, then they go to the stadium series. They lose six to three against the New Jersey Devils, but they bounce back in the three game road trip is all but a memory. And they grab three of a possible six points. What is a very bizarre road trip because they returned home after each game. They went to Toronto. They came home. They went to New Jersey for the stadium series. They came home. Then they went to Chicago, and now they're coming home, and a new home game is up on deck against the New York Rangers on Saturday. We'll talk about the upcoming schedule in in a little bit more detail in just a moment. But let's get to the particulars from the Flyers and the Blackhawks. Kind of a choppy first period, not one that you're going to use to uh, show any how-to videos of how to play the game. Flyers ended up with 16 shots in the period, but uh, there wasn't a lot of Great opportunities at either end. Flyers goal, you know, comes at 618. It's actually deflected off of a Blackhawks defender and in the net by Soderblom. And the Flyers take the one nothing lead. But that play happens because of the guy that got the secondary assist. I know sometimes people minimize secondary assists, and they're not all treated the same. The play is on the left wall, just inside the blue line in the offensive zone for the Flyers. And there's a bit of a loose puck, and it's kind of up for grabs. But three players on the Blackhawks are kind of like, are you going to get it? Am I going to get it? Who's going to get it? So Farabee jumps in to get the puck and kind of out savvies, if you will, with some nifty little stick plays. And three Blackhawks players. It's a 1v3 high in the D-zone board battle for Chicago. And somehow Farabee comes away with the puck. Unacceptable. I'm sure Luke Richardson was none too pleased. Farabee ends up working it around to Scott Lawton. Scott Lawton gets it to Travis Konechny. He's got traffic going to the net. He throws it to the net off a of Blackhawks defender. And then the Flyers take the one nothing lead. That's a 618 into the period. Uh, but at 735, just a little over a minute later, the Blackhawks get on the board. Colin Blackwell, this did not look like a goal from a guy that's only got 31 in his entire career and only four on the season. Really nice toe drag across the middle and is able to get Arison moving from his left to his right with some shuffles and get beat him where he was and didn't try and shoot it where he's going. Uh, as a goalie, you always like when that happens. Um, but Blackwell gets the goal, his fourth of the season. It makes it 1-1. Just prior to the Flyers scoring, Sam Arison made an unbelievable save on a two-on-one. Flyers gave up, I think, four two-on-ones in the first period. But the save he had to make on the this one in particular before the Flyers' first goal, he's got to move from his right to his left. He gets a tremendous rotation and push, and he's got the pad down along the ice, taking away the bottom third, and the glove perfectly positioned just above the pad and forward. The reason why the glove forward is so big because it kills the angle for the player receiving the pass to be able to go upstairs. If the glove is back here, you can go upstairs like that. As soon as I move it forward, you can't. The angle's gone. So good active hands forward makes a big glove save. Got a stoppage of play. And talking to Brian Smith at the first intermission on the radio, I said that is a really big save for him to do two things. First, put the New Jersey game behind him and playing outdoors. Normalize this game and normalize it with a really big save where you controlled a rebound. That kind of save will make a goaltender feel really good because it's a high-end scoring chance, and he made a really good save and was totally under control in making it. And he just, when he makes that save, he just looks big. Yeah, he gave up a goal to Blackwell a couple minutes later. That's okay. He looked like a rock the rest of the night. And even though some of the chances in the second period for Chicago, and really their only chances came on the power play, but he made several really good saves on the power play, flashing the right pad on three successive shots in one flurry at one point on the power play. 
He had to make a save on a Connor Bedard backhand where Bedard comes in. He's magical with his stick. And he, while possessing the puck on the rush, attacking the middle of the ice, and he loves to attack the middle, swats the stick of Nick Sealer to get it out of the way and then sho- shovels a backhand at Airson. Backhands are hell on earth for a goaltender. They're hard to read. Airson fought that one off. But Flyers blocked a lot of shots. And in watching Bedard through the first two periods, you can see that he loves to go to soft spots of the ice to get himself a little bit of space so he can make some magic happen. But anyway, Flyers would wrap up the first period. I got a little sidetracked. Uh, wrap up the first period tied at one with Chicago. They go into the second, 315 into the second. Travis Konechny, it looks like he's almost at the end of a shift. I'm not sure how far into the shift he was, uh, but he starts with the puck down at the face-off dot in the Flyers' D zone and just works his way up the ice. And again, it looked like the Blackhawks were just kind of watching as he's matriculating his way up the ice. And it wasn't smooth. He's kind of fighting the puck his way up the ice, but eventually he gets in stride up the left side on his off wing. And he's able to swing a puck off his backhand to his forehand and just one touch shot, a laser beam and beats, uh, beats the Chicago goaltender high glove. And you can tell the goaltender was not ready for it because he tries to make that shave in the butterfly with his shoulder should have been the glove up, uh, but connect caught him. And just an unbelievable shot. It's Konechny's 27th goal of the season. An end-to-end rush, unassisted goal for TK. That turns into the game winner. It's 2-1 Flyers. And then at 11.55 into the second period, Flyers get a little cushion when they score a goal like they would score last year. So, you, okay, so real quick, you have the Konechny goal, which is off the rush, basically from the D zone all the way up the ice. And then you have the Hathaway goal, which is – so. The connecting goal is like how they scored this year, most of their goals. Then the Hathaway goal is how they scored last year. Uh, basically, Cates and Paling, good four check. They get a puck to the net with traffic, and Garnet Hathaway's there to bang home a rebound. That's how they had to score last year. They didn't score off the rush last year, barely at all. Uh, this year, they do a lot of that, but you still get these kind of goals from guys like Garnet Hathaway. So good to see Noah Cates get a point. Good to see Ryan Paling get a point. And I said this on the post-game show. That's a line that I look at. I look at the way those three players play together. And again, Hathaway out there just banging everything that moves. It just throwing his body around, blocking shots. He just does everything a coach asks him to do. Is he the most skilled player? Hell no. But that line, that would be almost a set it and forget it for me, unless things go really sideways. I would almost say, okay, I'm not messing with that line. Cates fits there. He can maybe drive some offense from there. Paling, good centerman that can skate up the middle. Garnet Hathaway. I got three penalty killers on that line, too. I I like that element of having three guys that, if we do have to kill penalties, I can still get those three ice time in a different way. So, to me, that's a line I may set and forget um, and and use those guys in PK situations as well. But Garnet Hathaway, he he may be Daniel Briere's most savvy signing. And he, sometimes he doesn't play a ton of minutes, but you notice every minute that he plays. He's a real uh, pronounced player. He's never a, a passive player on the ice. So he, he just he's fun to watch too. Um, Hathaway in the game ends up playing 15 minutes. He's got three shots on goal. He gets the goal, obviously. Uh, he's got eight hits in the game. Had some blocks in the game. You know, that's exactly what he's here to do. A guy who comes in, you signed him to do a specific job, and all he's done since he's been here is do exactly his job. And pretty much, not only every game, but pretty much every shift. That's just the kind of player that he is. So real good signing, and I was happy to see him get that goal. You can get some ancillary scoring from some sources you usually don't get it from. It certainly helps, and that gives the Flyers a little bit of a buffer in this game against the Blackhawks uh, to be able to, not have to, you know, play in a one goal game against an inferior opponent. Now, this game is big for them. It's big for them because of what's coming up. It's why John Tortorella said, This game scares the crap out of me. He wanted to make sure his team went in there, took care of business, not only for the three game road trip, but take care of business against an inferior opponent, knowing that coming up Saturday, you have the Rangers coming in here. Sunday, you go to Pittsburgh. It's a back to back. You're on a back to back. Pittsburgh is not. Pittsburgh plays tomorrow or tonight, rather, and they don't play again until Sunday. So they're going to be laying in wait while the Flyers are coming in on a back-to-back. 
and a game against the, the Rangers. Then the Flyers are going to have that uh, game after Pittsburgh. They're going to welcome Tampa Bay. Tough opponent. Kucherov, we saw what he did last time. Then you get the Washington Capitals. So you got a lot of really tough teams coming in. You can't afford to have a slip up against the Chicago Blackhawks, who when they came into the game were minus 81 in goal differentials. 17 points from the Blackhawks in the eighth spot in the Central to the seventh spot team in the Central. So you couldn't have a slip up there, and the Flyers didn't. They took care of business. They got the two points. Now, the interesting thing about the schedule coming up as well is this. That was the last time the Flyers will go out of the time zone for the remainder of the season. They do have a 7:30 game uh, against St. Louis. That's at Wells Fargo Center, and that's because uh, I believe uh, that's a national game. Yeah, it's an ESPN Hulu game. So you're going to have all East Coast travel, not out of the time zone the rest of the way. But you don't have in the entire month of March. There's 15 games in 30 days, but you never have more than two straight games at home or two straight games on the road. So this the schedule starts out. At Washington, on the first, you have a back-to-back. Then you have at home against Ottawa. So you go from Washington to home. Then you have St. Louis at home. Then you go to Florida and Tampa for two. So two-game road trip. Then you come home for San Jose uh, and Toronto. Then you go to Boston. Then you come home against Toronto. You go to Carolina. You come home for Boston and Florida. Then you go to New York to take on the Rangers and Montreal. And then you come home for Chicago. It's kind of these little tiny burst trips. And maybe that'll make it feel more fresh, um, you know, where you're not like, okay, we're four straight games at home and it's lather, rinse, repeat, or it's four straight games on the road. They do have a four-game road trip in the month of April um, where they'll go to uh, Buffalo, Columbus, Montreal, and the Rangers. But maybe that breaks it up. I'm not sure. But it's kind of bizarre to see games and that much like back and forth kind of through an entire month where you have 15 games in 30 days. That's what the Flyers will deal with uh, coming up uh, in the month of March. Still got a few games before we get there. A few Im- very important games. Uh, game against Saturday against a team in the New York Rangers who have won eight straight. They've been tremendous of late. And then Pittsburgh, who is clinging uh, to any hopes of a playoff. And this weekend could be, if the Flyers are able to, to beat them in that game, they lose t- tonight against Montreal. And to the Flyers, it it's all over. But the... the uh, the fat lady singing for the Pittsburgh Penguins for the playoffs. So we'll see how it plays out this weekend, but really important games for the Flyers and other teams in the division uh, through this last six, seven weeks of the NHL regular season. Now, one of the big storylines of this regular season was obviously the Cutter Gauthier, Jamie Drysdale trade. Now Drysdale has been here now for 15 games. Did have some illness that he dealt with, played 10 games with Anaheim this season, had a goal and four assists for five points. Uh, with the Flyers this season now in 15 games, there's two goals, two assists, four points, um, is playing just over 19 minutes a night. Still, I think I still th- think you can kind of see him thinking out there, trying to get used to uh, playing from the man-on-man to the zone and, and doing what the Flyers want him to do, getting up the ice. Do see him getting up the ice a little bit more, but I still see moments in games where I feel like he's thinking a little bit. Um, but... Uh, He's going to be an important player, but there's still some adjustment that needs to take place in his game. But it is an adjustment going from living in Anaheim to living in Philadelphia in the middle of a season getting dealt that way and everything else. But I had a chance to catch up with Jamie uh, this week at practice. Talk to him about his assimilation uh, to being a Philadelphia Flyer, East Coast, um, the guys in the room and everything else. So here's my conversation with Flyers D, Jamie Drysdale. Fourth Flyers defenseman Jamie Drysdale, how was your uh, stadium series experience? I know you wanted a different result, but you weren't even didn't even know you'd be playing an outdoor game this year as a member of Anaheim when it began. But you end up outdoors and in front of seventy-two thousand. Yeah, I mean, you know, like you said, it would have been nice to come out with a win and put a little bit better of a performance out there. But uh, all in all, the experience was awesome. It was real cool, real cool to have that many people play in front of that many people, um, and our family there was. Uh, was kind of the cherry on top, so um, really cool experience, but what I like to... You go back to like when you're playing Pee Wee or Bantam hockey, you're looking just for anybody besides your parents in the stands, and you can never imagine playing in front of a crowd of that magnitude. Uh, th- does it give you some juice, uh, feeding off that energy? Yeah, I mean, it was wild. 
like, yeah, just seeing that many people, um, you know, that doesn't happen often, pretty much never. So um, it, was, it was a real cool environment to be a part of. Um, what's it been like for you kind of assimilating to this locker room? I know the guys got you on the Mexico trip during the break and been very welcoming, and I'm sure that that helped this process for you of going from the West Coast to the East Coast. Yeah, I mean, it's been awesome. These guys have made it real easy on me. Um, unbelievable group of guys, real close, real tight-knit, and just a great locker room, so um, I'm glad I can be a part of it. For you guys, you're going to be back at it Wednesday against Chicago, um, and the points, obviously, are, are of the utmost importance this time of year. Uh, are you a guy that kind of monitors what's going on within the division and stuff, or do you just kind of focus on your team and what you guys can do? A bit of both. Um, you always keep an eye, um, kind of know what the deal is, but... Um, I think everyone knows that, um, you know, this time of year is is where the points matter and and where you need to, you know, get as many as you can. Um, So um, these last 28, 29 games um, are real important for us. Is there a quiet intensity to a playoff race that maybe you haven't experienced as a pro? Absolutely. Um, Yeah, I mean, just kind of that practice. Meaningful hockey, right? Yeah, meaningful hockey, just being a part of it. You feel the emotion, you kind of get a little bit... Um, it's just a cool feeling to be a part of, um, you know, game in and game out, um, knowing how important it is. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun and, and good to be a part of. Jamie, enjoy the ride. Thanks for doing this. Thanks a lot. Great to catch up with Jamie Drysdale. And I know those guys in that locker room, they have welcomed him with open arms and he is fit right in, uh, with a good group of guys. It probably one of the things professional players in sports worry about when they get traded, like, oh my God, am I going to a good locker room? Am I going to be? You know, is the room good? Am I going to a toxic environment? That's not the case here. So that fear is allayed. Uh, But thanks to Jamie Drysdale for taking the time to join us on this episode of Flyers Daily. And thank you for taking the time to join us in this episode of Flyers Daily. Coming up tomorrow, we will uh, preview the weekend. We'll really look ahead at this Rangers-Penguins Metropolitan Division matinee weekend. Uh, We'll do that coming up in tomorrow's episode. So join us then on a brand new episode of Flyers Daily.